Hey everybody, welcome back to the Hard for Games channel. I'm your host, Tony, and today we have the 1998 Nintendo Sourcebook. Now, for those of you that are unaware, a source book is essentially a business Bible. This one in particular is especially important for retailers because it has marketing information, the marketing calendar, licensee information, how to purchase displays and promotional items for your store, etc., etc., etc. But why is this important to us? Well, obviously, it gives a pretty good indication as to Nintendo's business practices at the time, especially with their retail partners. But for you prototype and beta heads out there, this is also a small treasure trove of information. This contains unused placeholder box art, it has unused logos, and it also has beta screenshots from Zelda 64 and the Conquer 64 or Conquer's Quest or whatever it was at that particular point in time that are uh, far better quality than what you would see in a printed magazine of the time. Just more dots per inch, more detail, better color. So we're going to go through this not necessarily line by line because there's a lot of information here and we'd be here all day but i'm going to give you the cliff notes version of it and we're gonna go ahead and explore all right so let's go ahead and dive into it 98 source book binder has locking rings to open pull back metal tabs at end of binder then pull rings open so here we have the table of contents, new products, product ordering information, marketing calendar, retail marketing program, merchandising, product support, and of course, subcategories within each. Each major category is divided up by, well, a divider, and uh, it has a nice quality print of a Nintendo game character, or in this case, a rare LTD game character. 1998 products. We have some nice big character imagery here. Opening it up, we have lots of information on, of course, Nintendo products. Game Boy, Game Boy Color, N64, but there is a bit of an oddity here. So if you take a look in the corner, you see The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time with a logo that is very clearly not Ocarina of Time's logo and is an older Zelda logo. I think what happened here is whoever put this together just maybe didn't have the correct logo and pulled whatever they happened to have off of their PC and placed it in its spot. That is my best guess. And you see a decent amount of that throughout this. Uh, I believe different people and different teams worked on this. And in various cases, you have instances of logos that are placeholder or possibly just earlier versions. And here we have 12 Tales, Conquer 64, with a real nice image of Conquer there with the acorns flying all over the place. Here we have Nintendo licensees and the licensee information, Konami, Rare, uh, Namco, Chemco, all sorts of info here and contact information for those specific companies. Here we have the licensed products and Nintendo licensee list. We have the name of the company, the rep or the sales rep from the company and what they do here. Now, I don't mind keeping in all of the company information because that's just public knowledge, but there's a chance that maybe the sales reps still work for the company and maybe have the same number. I mean, I doubt it. It's been decades, but you never know. Um, so, you know, keeping the company information, but going to be blurring out the sales rep info, like the actual telephone numbers and such. But for example, you have Ambassador Eyewear. Barry is the rep. They do prescription eyewear and sunglasses. Good Humor, Briars, the rep, ice cream bars. And moving on to the product ordering information with Pikachu. Now this page is particularly interesting. Pokemon, catch them if you can, has information on the games and seemingly placeholder box art. I've never seen these boxes before, anywhere, in any region. Maybe I'm missing something, but this either seems to be unused or placeholder or, or something to that effect. It's very strange looking. I wish that this particular page was of higher print quality like some of the other pages in this binder. Unfortunately, this seems to be just kind of your standard office color printer print job. It's the announcement you've been waiting for. Game Boy Color is on the way. I love how they just like had to change the color of the font <laughs> all the way down. It's like, I don't know what to do graphic design. Uh, make it red, make it blue, make it orange. I don't know. 
here we have Nintendo Player's Guide. So if you wanted to purchase strategy guides for your store, uh, here's the information regarding that. So let's say you wanted Super Metroid, uh, you had to purchase a master case quantity of 30, meaning that was the minimum purchase quantity, and the unit price per would be 650. So you'd multiply 650 by 30, and that would be your total, excluding like, I'm assuming taxes and shipping, etc. So here we have the Nintendo Inventory Management System. Obviously, lots of information here. I'm not going to read through all of it, uh, but I do enjoy the mock-up of the shipping label. 1234 Main Street NE Anytown. Moving on to the marketing calendar with a nice picture of Mario here. Here we have the 1999 fiscal year media plan. What I find particularly interesting about this, aside from, well, all of it, is that they had 12 Tales Conquer 64 lined up for... 1026 through 1129. They had already had it in their calendar to promote it. Little did they know, Rare would take like another two or three years <laughs> to finally release the damn game. Here we have the Retail Marketing Program. Retail Marketing Program, fiscal year 1999. This is particularly dense and detailed. I'm not going to go through it line by line, but just so you're aware, it is here. And here we have the N64 MAP, MAP Plus program, fiscal year 1999. So for those of you that don't know, MAP or minimum advertised pricing is basically when a company says that, hey, you can purchase our games, you can be a wholesaler, distributor, or whatever, but you cannot advertise these items, the units, for below a certain amount. And the reason why companies do that is because it helps uh, prevent uh, driving down of the normalized perception of the price of their products. Um, unfortunately, it isn't particularly consumer friendly because obviously as a consumer, you want to purchase uh, a product for as low as you possibly can, but a lot of companies have map pricing. Nintendo in this case has map pricing as well, but it's part of a program. So they reiterate that you don't have to necessarily follow it. You can, you know, sell the games for whatever price you want to, uh, even if you are selling them at a loss, but there are benefits benefits for following the Map Plus program that they've laid out. Merchandising. Merchandising. Now here we have some real nice images of retail and kiosk displays. It's real interesting too because you have a lot of real early images here, especially with Zelda 64. Uh, this one in particular is of the FSTDAN first dungeon, quote unquote, uh, that was discovered in the Giga Leak. Here's Banjo-Kazooie, F-Zero X, Another early Zelda 64 image. And we just have some really cool displays here. They look pretty futuristic. Mario dimensional statue. Three dimensional, four foot high Mario figure is totally unique and can be used to create a visual excitement within your store. There's another one for Fox, and but he looks, looks a little weird, <laughs> to say the least. Now this page is particularly interesting for a number of reasons. First off, we have 12 Tales Conquer 64 posters and merchandise that retailers could order well before the game was going to be released. In fact, rebranded and released years later as Conquer's Bad Fur Day. So I wonder how many retailers had purchased these and then just tossed them because they couldn't do anything with them. Another interesting note here is that we have F-Zero X with seemingly an unused logo. Now, there have been a number of F-Zero X logos that have been discovered over the years, including these ones and this one right here from a VHS tape that I preserved, but I've never seen this one. I don't know if it is undiscovered or what, but certainly interesting. Now, here we have some of the big guns. Four monitors stacked vertically, four monitors split. So we have that, that dungeon, that Zelda dungeon split between four monitors here. This one's six monitors, just absolutely mammoth. And we ended up getting a real good scan of this image right here, the Zelda 64 image. Here it is compared to what is currently available online. And I don't know if it's just my eyes or maybe this has more details or what, but I did notice more when I looked at this particular version of it. For example, I had never really seen these colorful pinwheels or flags or whatever they are in the background. It makes me very curious as to what they were supposed to be. Video wall. Plug, play, and roll system features five preset programs on nine 25-inch color monitors equipped with image mag processor. No on-site programming is ever needed. $22,000 of 1998 money. 
Here's the next most expensive at $12,500. Hanging video wall uses 425 inch monitors available in red, blue, or yellow, includes video cables and hanging truss system. Image mag processor, no on-site programming is ever needed. Damn. And a product returns checklist on laminated paper. Nintendo authorized repair centers, busted system. And that's it, except for a little snippet of the 1995 source book that I happened to pick up on eBay recently. Nintendo product returns policy and procedures. This is decidedly more boring, but <laughs> interesting nonetheless for anyone that wants to take a read. Thank you everybody again for watching. That's it for today. We have the 1998 source book and a teeny bit of the 1995 source book that I kind of just picked up on, on eBay. <laughs> Aside from that, thank you again for watching and we'll see you all next time.